Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. It's a little bit faint, but we can. OK, great. Um, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this educational talk about spinlock-induced crossing, or SLIC for short. Um, when I first developed SLIC, I didn't have parahydrogen applications in mind, but it's now become part of the FIP and Saber toolbox here um, via sequences like Lightsaber and Slick Saber. So I'm going to give you an overview of this technique, which will hopefully help you uh, use these in your research. Um, first, I will give a brief review of NMR with two coupled spins, which will show why we need something like Slick Sequence and how it comes about. And then I will uh, discuss a number of applications in FIP and Saber, as well as uh, high and low field NMR spectroscopy. Um, so for typical NMR, uh, let's assume we have liquid state here. Um, the spectrum is determined by chemical shifts, delta nu, and by their J coupling, which is the spin-spin interaction between two spins. Um, now most NMR takes place in the weak coupling regime, and this means that delta nu is much greater than J. And uh, this is kind of spectrum that makes spectroscopists happy. We simply get splitting due to delta nu and then a smaller one due to J, which is very easy to interpret and can be calculated with first order perturbations just of the Zeeman product states. Stephen, I think you're not sharing the correct window, so we're just I'm still sorry. we're still seeing your title, your uh, outlined uh, title slide. Sorry. Oh, that's weird. Uh, okay. How's that? That's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so. <clears throat> Again, for uh, the weak coupling regime, we get a nice spectrum with uh, delta nu here and smaller coupling due to J is all it's the first order perturbation. Um, <clears throat> if delta nu becomes smaller, closer to the order of J, we start getting second order effects where the central states start to mix. We get extra second order terms in here. And what we see is that the inner peaks start to get bigger, the outer peaks start to get smaller. However, if we flip the situation around, you have what I would call the strong coupling regime, where J is much greater than delta nu, we see something altogether different. Um, as delta nu goes to zero, we end up with just a single peak in the center which is the interaction between the now triplet states, T plus, T zero, and T minus. And we don't get an interaction between those and the singlet state. So these become forbidden, um, the intensity dropping now quadratically with this ratio delta nu over J. Um, and to get these states, we can't use perturbation theory anymore. We have to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Um, so now the singlet and triplet don't interact via B1 or dipole-dipole Hamiltonian any longer. And this is due to the symmetry difference between the singlet and triplet states. Um, this is both a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is that the singlet can now have a very long lifetime because it's no longer connected via some of these relaxation terms. Unfortunately, it's also bad because we can't populate the singlet state with a simple RF pulse. Um, another thing is that we can't measure the chemical shift difference or J coupling anymore from the spectrum because all of that information is lost. So how can we solve this problem? Um, so let's start with how we would do it with normal NMR. So normally we move populations around a block sphere um, and we'd like to look at it as two level system. So for one spin, for instance, we would have an up state and a down state with 
the energy difference is uh, nu. So we have energy nu over two and negative nu over two. And we would simply apply a resonant V1 field. So V1 rotating at the same frequency as our frequency difference between spins. Um, that allows us to go to a rotating frame where the populations have the same energy and we have some interaction term. Now if the nutation frequency simply drives nutation around V1 between up and down states. So this is a coherent population trend. Now let's look at that same matrix, but for our two spin system. Now we have four states and in the strong coupling regime, three of those are triplets, D plus, minus, and zero. And we have a singlet state over here. Now, if we put in, <clears throat> we go to the rotating frame and put in our mutation frequency due to B1. What we see is that only the triplet states are connected. On the other hand, we do have a connection between singlet and triplet, but it's driven by any delta nu that might be available. And this comes about if we don't have pure equivalence, but only near equivalence. Um, however, you'll notice that because there's an energy difference, an energy gap of J between triplet and singlet, this term really has no effect in driving this transition coherently. So now, is there a way to bring singlet and triplet into resonance? Um, one way would be, like Thomas mentioned, going to a very low field where you can actually match up these uh, states. But can we do it at high field or any field that we want? Well, unfortunately, we can't do what we would normally do in regular NMR, which would be to modulate this interaction term and bring it onto residence. So we can't modulate delta nu because we don't control it. Although in reality, uh, nature does this through CSA, which can cause relaxation. Um, <clears throat> so what else can we do? Well, here I had an idea due to something my thesis advisor, Ron Walsworth, said once. Um, and we had been using CW spin locking to make singlet states out of weakly coupled spins. Um, and for these nearly equivalent spins, Ron said instead, well, J coupling is just like an internal spin locking field. So I thought, well, then if I apply an external field at some point, at some power, I should get a sum and difference frequency with a difference frequency counteracting this internal spin lock. Um, then the singlet and triplet would behave as if there's only weakly coupled again. Uh, now this is a somewhat naive view of the situation, but let's just try it with the real Hamiltonian equation and see what happens. Let's spin lock by applying V1 continuously and re-diagonalize the Hamiltonian. What we end up getting First of all, is that we get new rotated triplet states. So we get singlets, which remains the same, but triplet states along the x-axis. And we now get energy levels that depend on E1, so the nutation frequency. And if we plot these energy levels, versus mutation frequency, what we see is this splitting of the triplet levels linearly with new n. Now, something interesting happens when new n equals j, this point here. We end up getting what I call a spin lock induced crossing. So at this point, singlet and one of the triplet states has the same energy. Now, if we add in delta nu term, this becomes an anti-crossing. And if we sit at this state 
we can actually get a coherent interaction between the two. Alternatively, if we move through this state slowly enough, we get adiabatic transition. Um, in the matrix form, it looks something like this. And this suggests that now there are two available paths for connecting singlet and triplet. One way is to now set mutation frequency equal to J. So if nu n equals J, we have a nice block sphere here where delta nu can drive transition. Um, another way is to use an echo train to modulate essentially delta nu, or at least make a modulation appear to singlet state, for example, by continuously flipping between singlet and triplet, or I'm sorry, between triplet plus and triplet minus, so that the sign here continuously changes. And this is actually the basis for the magnetization to singlet or M2S S2M method, which uh, someone else may talk about. So now I'm going to continue talking about slick, which is this first method. <clears throat> so now our lower corner represents a block sphere. And I can just draw my block sphere between D plus and singlet. And we get a rotation around delta nu AB. So this looks the same as what we had with normal NMR, but now with totally different energy and interaction terms. I have delta nu replacing D1. And I have P plus and S0 replacing up and down state. Now, since these triplet states are rotated, as Konstantin mentioned, we need to have polarization along the x-axis first. So we need to do a 90 degree pulse before this spin lock. Ix plus i1x plus i2x is simply this population difference between these triplet plus and triplet minus states. And here's a simulation of what happens when we turn on spin locking. So we now get a coherent and direct transfer between the X magnetization and we get built up into the singlet state. Um, the nice thing about this is that the slick pulse works the same way backwards because it's coherent. So if I do it again, I can get coherent transfer back out of singlet back into X polarization. Um, another nice thing is that we can control the length of this pulse. So we can control the flip angle, just like we would do with regular NMR. And we can use a shorter pulse to make, for example, singlet triplet superposition. So now, <clears throat> How do we get this working? How do we calibrate our system? Um, well, we can do a simple slick sequence where we simply transfer to singlet and measure directly afterwards. And if we do this at various mutation frequencies, what we see is that we get a dip when nu n equals j at this resonant condition. And this allows us to measure the J coupling now, where we had no information before. So for instance, in this chemical, we can measure J equals 17.5 hertz. We can also allow the system to evolve afterwards and read out again. And now we can vary two things. We can vary, vary the spin lock time duration. And we see that there's some maximum transfer at a certain point which actually depends on delta nu AB. From that, we can measure what delta nu AB is. So again, for this chemical, we end up getting 2.15 Hertz. And we can do other experiments. For example, we can change the evolution time to measure the singlet lifetime, or we could do other experiments in this period as well. 
now what happens if we have more than two spins? For example, in a FIP system or a Sabre system. Well, we can split this into two different situations, which I'll talk about. Um, the first is a homonuclear case. For example, what if we have many spins that are all equivalent? Then we end up getting complex dress states beyond just singlet and triplet. Um, the other case is a heteronuclear system. So let's say we have separate dress states, singlet and triplet, for each type of nucleus, but we can access them individually. For example, if we have a pair of protons and a pair of carbon-13, or if we have cases where the proton groups have large enough chemical shifts. Um, let's talk about this second case first. So now let's say we have two spin pairs, for example, a pair of C13s or a pair of protons um, and a pair of nitrogen 15s, any combination of these. Um, now each pair has equivalent or near equivalent spins, but again, they have different resonance frequencies. We can write out a system like Thomas showed earlier with 16 product states, for example, singlet, singlet, triplet, triplet, etc. cetera. Um, what we end up getting are two interesting matrices of Hamiltonians, one containing symmetric components, for example, singlet, singlet with triplet, triplet state, and one containing anti-symmetric components. So for instance, singlet, triplet with triplet, singlet state. And now here, the difference between this and the Saber sheath is that one of these triplet states is going to be spin locked. So we have something along the x-axis instead of along z. And what's interesting is that we actually get something that looks almost identical to what we had with Saber sheath. But now the energy levels here are determined by nu n, the strength of our B1 field. However, everything else is pretty much the same. Again, singlet singlet energy level is given by some of these intra pair J couplings and the interaction term is given by the sum and difference of these sin and anti J couplings which can drive an interaction at the appropriate resonance condition. For singlet triplet and triplet singlets we have the same interaction terms and the same energy levels except for singlet triplet, which is now the difference between these two energies. So now we can consider a couple different geometries. Um, one we can look at is the ABBA system, which is pretty common. For example, if we have a pair of C13s sandwiched between a pair of protons or sandwiched even between more complex groups for example, in diacetylene or diethyl oxalate. Another system common to you is the Sabre system. So here we have protons sandwiched between N15s on the iridium complex. How can we use Flick now to do something with these states? Well, in the first case, we can start out with a triplet triplet system and spin locking on either protons or C13s, we can drive this resonance condition and drive polarization directly to a singlet singlet state. The neat thing about this is that all of these proton pairs and C13 pairs have equivalent spins, which would otherwise be inaccessible. However, this now lets us make singlet states on the C13. And because of the symmetry of these molecules, these can have very long lifetimes. We can also now do saber at high fields, for example, with light saber or slick saber. So we can drive this transfer between singlet, singlet, and B plus T0, where now T0 and S0B are on the proton, and S0A. P plus are on the nitrogen. So we're moving singlet 
polarization from the proton into nitrogen. Um, now, because the coupling strength between N15s is very small, we actually also hit the second resonance condition at the same time. And what that ends up doing is depopulating the P minus state, making singlet in these nitrogens. And when we add these two effects together, we see that the population just difference, which represents X magnetization, can get very big. So we can effectively move polarization between singlet hydrogen and these N15. And in Levitt's lab, they showed that you can also do the same thing with a three spin system. So you can move singlet polarization from two polarized protons directly to a C13 state. So now you get polarized X minus polarization. This is an example from Thomas's Saber paper, 9.4 Teslas, by hitting the bound pyridine resonance frequency with a B1 field, you can now get high levels of polarization out of slick uh, saber, whereas you wouldn't with without that pulse. There's another paper from Edward's group. Um, they performed FIP at 47 and a half milliteslas, where you still would not have the sheet condition. So if you don't do anything, you still don't see the singlet polarization. But if you do slick, you convert it to observable magnetization. Um, the nice thing about this is that they can change the time gap between polarization and readout. So you can actually measure how long the singlet state lifetime is, it's nine seconds. And if you want, you can take polarization out in smaller intervals by doing partial slick pulses, for example, a small flipping. Um, the second geometry where you can get these pairs of pairs would be an A2-B2 system. And what you can do here is actually transfer polarization or signal between singlets in these different pairs. Um, we demonstrated this in glutamate and in some polypeptides like phenylalanine, glycine, glycine. So now, for instance, if you have your glutamate at 4.7 T, you can see these two pairs individually. There's a singlet triplet system here and a singlet triplet system on this pair as well. And you can write out similar matrices as before. Um, now with one small difference, which is that here we end up spin locking both of these pairs at the same time. So now we need to match the resonance condition that the difference in the spin locking strength matches this difference in intrapair J coupling. If we match that condition, then we get interaction again due to the difference in sin and anti J coupling, which can drive polarization between ST here and TS in this pair. Um, now, how can we do that? Well, we can simply put our spin locking on one state in one pair, let's say pair two, and we can set it so that pair one sees the slightly different um, B1 field, and that difference equals this resonance condition. So now we can do all of our typical J coupling and NMR experiments, um, but now between a singlet A and a singlet B block sphere. So how do we do this? We first, for instance, make a singlet on pair one using slick or whatever your favorite sequences. 
We then spin lock at a higher power to preserve it. And to do a Rabi experiment, we leave this for some evolution time before reading out again, either on the original pair or the second pair. And what we see is this nice Rabi curve between pair one and pair two, showing that we've transferred singlet state. Um, the frequency of this interaction gives us now the difference between sin and J, sin and anti-J couplings, which for glutamate is 2.57 hertz. Um, we can also adjust this spin locking power to find our resonance condition, which we find is 2.3 hertz. So that's the energy gap between singlet A and singlet B. We can also do something like a Ramsey experiment where we actually make a coherence between these singlet states by doing a 90 degree pulse, um, letting it process and then reading out again. If we do that, we get a nice Ramsey curve again with the frequency being 2.3 Hertz difference between these two energies. Stephen, we're just in the sort of question period, so I don't know where you are. Okay. Um, do you want to do you want to kind of? Yeah, I'm going to go quickly then. Okay. Just mention a second case to be aware of, which is uh, what happens when you have more than two nearly equivalent spins. It starts to get complicated, but it can be all calculated. Um, either by hand or preferably via simulation. So, for example, if you have ethanol, you end up having 32 spin states, um, a methyl group and a methylene group, and you can actually calculate what they all are um, and find where these level crossings now are of the more complex states. So, for instance, we end up getting things like five halves, three halves, and one halves dress states. And you can now perform slick on those more complex states. So for ethanol, for instance, instead of just having nu n equals j, you actually get transitions of things like three halves j and five halves j. Um, and you can perform these same slick experiments, for example, at low field, Six and a half milliteslas, where you have no um, no identifying spectral features in a conventional spectrum, just a single line. But you can get a slick spectrum by doing just a slick pulse and readout, and you can see that you get, for instance, dips at five halves and three halves j. Um, you can end up seeing the difference when you add in more spins. For example, if you make it anhydrous and add in the OH group, you get a totally different spectrum. Um, and you can do the same thing even at higher fields, for instance, in all of these chlorinated benzenes. You just get a unremarkable single line spectrum, even at half a Tesla. But if you do slick, you can find where these level crossings are, and those positions are different for all of the different chemicals. Um, this is something to be aware of when you do your lightsaber and slick saber experiments on more complex molecules. So for example, when you do it on something like propane, Edward's group showed that the optimal point isn't to do slick at J, but actually at 2J and 3J because now you need to consider the more complex stress states and which states are initially polarized. And some people may also discuss some other slick derivatives. For example, you can make these pulses adiabatic by doing longer, more ramp-like pulses, which broadens your B1 and B0 bandwidth, which is nice if you don't know exactly what J is beforehand. Okay, I'll skip that and just say, uh, so thanks for listening and thanks to Matt Rosen and Ron Walsworth, who I worked with for many years, and also now uh, Sumyajit Mandel and Mason, who allowed me to do some of these slick experiments at 0.5T.
Um, if you'd like more information, please see our book chapter. We have one in Long Live Nuclear Spin Order. Um, and I'll take questions here as well as on the uh, Slack workspace if you'd like to ask me there. Um, so thanks. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, we do have time for one question. Okay. Um, and so the question is, what's a typical conversion efficiency for a slick sequence? Does it approach the maximal symmetry bounds that is root two thirds for longitudinal magnetization to singlet order in a two, in a two spin system? And uh, yes. So and the second piece, let me just give you the second piece okay. of that. Uh, how does this efficiency change outside of the strong coupling regime? Right, so if it's perfectly coupled, if you have perfect strong coupling, yes, it matches exactly. Um, as you start to get out to other regimes, it doesn't work anymore. And in that case, you would use, for example, for weak coupling, you would use some other sequence with, uh, there's some echo sequences you could use. And in intermediate regimes, you would want to use probably one of these adiabatic sequences. So it's like APSOC, for instance, right. a derivative, or some of these uh, adiabatic slicks, which would work better. Um, and you can calculate what the ideal sequence would be for those cases. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, 